Okay. Well, I I had just a few questions this week for some folks, um, and one of them uh, is Robin on. Um, had to do with um, the SSA 1000, um, and I don't see Robin on the line on our list, so I may wait for her to join. Or Robin, are you out there? And I just can't tell. Um, does anybody else have an SSA 1000 that they're using that they're worried about? Because if not, we'll wait for Robin to jump on. Okay. And then Amy, did we get that? Um, the amperage question answered for you on the um, the simulation. Oh yeah. Yeah, you did. Thank you. Cool. And, and Adam, that was it was a rounding error because if you calculate the voltage and the total resistance, you get like point what was it? Any point one o nine something something something, and then that is yeah. That. The ampere read 0.11, and that rounding caused that other number to show up. Right. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Go you and your kids. We might like whatever. It's fine. It's good. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate it. That great. Um, we have almost everybody is um, who's been working the whole year is into 21, which means we've got some uh, trusses going on. Um, and people seem to be doing okay um, with that. So I didn't have any questions there. Um, okay. We've got some folks who are um, doing 216 um, who are that far along, so you're pretty far into it. And then we also have some folks who are, you know, kind of at the end of uh, Unit 2 getting ready to go into Unit 3. So, um, so people are moving along. I think Adam and I um, are going to talk more about uh, Unit 3 tonight. Does anybody have a question they want to throw out that I didn't catch in the email this week? Okay, and as always, if you want to type a question, who met, Adam or I, whoever's not uh, currently teaching the time, we'll try and, uh, we'll try and answer that if we can, um, just to keep that going along. Um, one thing that I kind of wanted to show you, I know that one of the issues with everything we do in POE is how do you store the stuff that you've got. And so, um, Adam, can you turn the screen over to me? Sure. All right. <clears throat> screen, presenter. Okay, let's see if I can do the right thing once that comes. There you go. Okay. Um, okay. Is that showing up for you guys? A picture of a box? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let's go back. Let's see if I can try this again. It did not look like it normally does, Adam. So, um, in theory, am I the presenter right now on your stuff? Yeah. Okay. That does, do you have that little icon up in the middle? Is that there? You go. Yeah. That looks good. Do, do you guys miss that app? Awesome. Okay. Good so this is uh, this is kind of my uh, attempt at um, mild organization um, of the uh, parts that we have to deal with in Bex. So. <clears throat> Uh, these are the batteries that you have to charge um, for your kids to uh, run the robots. And um, they have to be plugged in every night. And let me show you what the back of this box looks like. Oh, fire hazard. <laughs> um, each of these little chargers gets plugged in. And then they have a cord on the other side that the battery hooks into. Um, and so this is the box that I actually store the chargers in when I'm not using it and then I just cut holes in the bottom. I've got two of these so I can get um, there I put about 13 or 14 of them in each in each of my boxes. Uh, one of the reasons that I do that is on the back of these um, there's a little switch right here and that little switch says one side says fast and the other side says safe which then means that one's fast, one's slow, one's safe, one's not safe. 
um, you don't want the kids jacking around with these switches. You want to make sure that those are set on safe or they get super hot. Um, there's not a lot of benefit for charging fast because it, it equivalently dissipates fast. So um, that one thing I do is I kind of hide this from the kids and then it doesn't get unplugged and stuff like that. The other thing I do is I just put these on today. Um, every one of these batteries will have a little tag on it with masking tape on the um, cord. One year my kids remnants taped on the batteries and the tape got really hot because these batteries get hot. Um, a, ta a tag with the kids' names on it. Because if you didn't plug your battery in yesterday, then you should be the guy who has the consequence of not having a battery. So, um, so I have the kids have names on their batteries, so when they go to get their battery, they know that they were responsible for charging that or not. Um, so that's kind of, it's to keep that big mess right there from being out and about and the, the backs come unplugged and it's really been the most efficient use of um, how to maintain the batteries that I have. Um, and it's not, it's not beautiful, but it's <laughs> really functional. So um, Adam, do you have any recommendations for how you guys deal with your batteries? Yeah, with the, <clears throat> I do something similar. I built, uh, you know, my background's in, in tech ed, you know, I'm a woodshop teacher, so I build a box and I have them all mounted and zip tied and, and then I have the cables come out in a trough in the bottom for all the batteries. Um, but it is nice to be able to, um, like, I just pick up the one box and move all the batteries and put them away and bring them out so it makes it a little bit easier than having cords everywhere. Um, but definitely some sort of system where it's it's easy. It, it, and if you're getting the newer VEX, like if you're coming into a kit that was bought in the last... I would say, I think two years, then you would get the gray style, right? I yeah, think, I think there's yeah. maybe one back here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this gray one's the new one, these blue ones are the old ones. Yeah, they were the they, gray ones yeah. Hot. yeah, they were an answer to the problems that the, the, the blue ones would have with overheating and damaging the batteries, and the gray ones are definitely better, so they're a step in the right direction. Um. Yes, I am not an industrial tech teacher and do not have access to anything but boxes from paper and uh, utility knives. But yeah, so some some sort of idea, and I would really promote some sort of responsibility to having your battery plugged in, um, because if it's if you if you don't have a battery, you're out for the day. Um, I do have a stash of like six extra batteries that I charge on my desk. Uh, just if the moment arises and everybody needs that, then I, I do have some backups. Um, and it just really, it depends, you know, how uh, how much is being used. If I have kids coming in really, you know, at night and working a couple hours, then we need to make sure that the batteries are good to go. Have you, Karen, have you experienced any, like, how many years have you had these batteries right now? Um, some of these are, my oldest are eight years old. Okay. Um, I bought some new ones last year. Um, my old ones are, they're, they're dying. Okay, yeah, because that, that's the question I was having, because I have, um, I think mine are about five years old, and I'm experiencing, you know, they don't, they don't last. Like, you know, when you, um, when you go to run, like, multiple motors at the same time, it'll die, like, It'll run like one, but as soon as you start to run two or something, it's overpowered. It won't work. Yeah, um, my uh, you know my new ones, uh, it's it's a tough investment because they're really ridiculously expensive. Um, but yeah, they're going to be how I spend some tech money next uh, this year is to uh, get kind of update them. And the new ones are just every, I think everything we've got because the new ones are better. So. Um, so yeah, so just kind of if you in adopted a set, if you inherited a set, you might find out how old they are. Um, you also want you can mine that are about to die get really really hot, really fast, um, and so even when they're on safe mode, so you just need to be you know you just want to be cognizant of that. I tell the kids if you pick your battery up and it's hot, like you want to drop it because it was so hot then we need to get you a different battery because what I don't want to have happen is the whole you know, hoverboard incident with, uh, with the VEX batteries. Not that that's happened. I don't want to think it freaked anybody out. Okay. So 
Um, I'm gonna. We went through the three one uh, video or three one PowerPoint the other day, um, which was you know kind of talking about the beginning of um, well just all the parts, all the sensors, all we, all we're doing with that. Um, uh, oh, another word to the wise: if you are using inherited parts. Um, one of the most broken parts is the potentiometer. So um, you might, when kids are checking those out from you or however you're assigning the parts, have them test them, get an axillum and test them and make sure that, um, I'm, I'm pretty conscientious about it and we still found one out of 25 that I put out today that, that the stop mechanism inside was broken. So um, we're just starting through one and so. Just uh, that that part's super easy to break, and and you just don't want to give some of the broken ones to start with. Um, but um, oh, what does it look like? Was oh, what it looks like when it's broken? Broken is it spins all the way. It's the potentiometer. Um, it's one of the sensors. Um, red, they're all red. It's a little round. Um, but um. I'm going to lead you guys through the flowchart PowerPoint, um, partially because it's super easy to skip, especially if you are not use if you are using VEX and Robot C. Um, though uh, for about the last four years, I've been writing questions for the end of course exam, um, and the questions that are landing on the test tend to land um, about a year or three semesters after I've written them. And so um, last year when you're in the test writing committee, you write five questions and you get to review 10 other questions. So, so I had access to about 15 questions. And of the 15 that I saw last year, 10 of those 15 were based on programming. And there had been um, some transition time where Project Lead the Way had not really tested a lot of programming questions and that's because they were kind of transitioning between the two languages. Um, so I was a little surprised when two of us uh, were asked to create those, um, though obviously the pool is really empty because we haven't had them for a long time. So um, some of my questions were about flow charting and so um, it just triggered to me, I need to make sure that I'm doing flow charting now that I'm not using RoboPro, which kind of mandates that you follow flow charting. So um, this um, PowerPoint is in 312. It doesn't take long. Um, if, they, if kids can read a flow chart um, and understand where the decisions come in a flow chart, then I think they're okay. They're, obviously, it's not open-ended, so they're not going to be you know, drawing a flowchart. But um, flowcharts, you know, you notice here, it's got um, it's a schematic. And as some of you who are like old like me, um, when I was in college and I have a computer science minor, we used to have uh, what was called a geometer, and it had all of these symbols on it. And we, in our programming classes, would have to write a flow chart um, using these symbols uh, as our rough draft for the programs that we were going to write. And so um, we got pretty savvy at using them and uh, having those those around. But probably kids haven't seen those. Probably kids haven't seen the geometer, to be honest. So um, this is a flow chart about you know checking to see if the dog needs you know some more food or not. So notice that there are different shapes and there's a flow to what happens here. This is probably the most interesting of the components of the flowchart because that is where a decision is made. Um, so these icons are different shapes depending on what they are, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but like I said, the questions that I saw were based upon um, a student's ability to follow a flowchart. Questions were, you know, what happens next in this flowchart? What happens if this occurs? You know, how many? How many? What were the outputs of the program that's written based on this flowchart? So I, I don't think you have to do a lot with it, other than make sure your kids aren't thrown off by the fact that they've never seen it before. So these are the different symbols. You notice that the flowchart we just saw had this oblong figure for the start and the end. Process is a rectangle. Inputs and outputs are this parallelogram. 
the uh, rhombus shape or this diamond shape um, is a decision box. It's, it's one of the most important. We group them with arrows. And this is the display. And if we wanted to have it you know, show something as, as, uh, as part of the process. So it kind of runs through and says this is you know, the start and the end. And if, if you, uh, for those of you, if you're using Fisher, this is what your little start and end box looks like. And so, so that makes a lot of sense. This is a process, anything that needs to happen. So there are some examples. Add one, turn the motor on, turn the motor off, or light off, rotate apart. You need to do something. There's a verb involved that. So some operations need. So, you know, do something. Time the operation. Check the balance, right? Input output. We need to get we need to get something from you or something from a sensor of some sort. Here's the rhombus shape and this has a couple of exits from it. So it's definitely going to have a go into that and then there's going to be a couple of options at least as to how we travel off that. There could be three options. If we travel in with our input from one corner, we could have three options from there um, depending what we've got going on with our program. But this is where we have to make a decision. Do we want to go this way with our program or another way with our program? The arrow is just the connector between those. Um, it just links from one to the other. Um, if it's a linear flow chart, then that would be pretty obvious, but as soon as we start having decision matrices in it and we get more than one option, then those errors will tell us where we're falling and where we're going back to in our process if we've got a come back to or a turnaround point. So they just want us to write a little program here for um, the flow chart, count to one to nine by odd numbers, Okay, so before you do that, you have to determine what are we going to output, what do we have to input. So first block is always that start, that oblong, right? So the output would be 13579. Um, start block is always first. So we would start here. We would do an arrow. If we want to start with one, we would need to have somebody input where we started, right? So they need to input a one, okay? Then from there, if we wanted to say out loud or display or whatever, in this case we're going to have it say that number. And then from there it's going to add two because that's how we travel to the next odd number. So, so far we haven't had any decision to make. We had an input value. This is where we're going to start. We said, hey, we're at one. We're going to add two to get to our next number. Now the question comes, are we bigger than nine? Because we're going to stop at nine. If the answer is yes, we're bigger than nine, then we're done. If the answer is no, we're not bigger than nine, then we're going to have to link all the way back up here or where we're going to say the number and then we're going to continue to add to and check. So the answer is no in our case. So we're going to link back above, say the number. Yeah, it's okay. We had one. We added two to it. We said it. We added two to it or three. Is it bigger than nine? Nope. Then we better say that number and keep going through the process. And we do that again and again and again. And this right here would terminate. But by the flow of it, we should actually have an end to the program. So yes, and then it would end. Um, I, for, um, first job out of undergrad into graduate school before I went to grad school was I was a programmer for Sprint. And so um, I am a firm believer in pseudocode or flow charting. Um, I don't use flow charting anymore, but at least a pseudocode where you are essentially doing the rough draft of the program. The fact is if you can't tell me in English what you want the program to do, then there's no way you can tell me in robot C what you want the program to do. So um, when Adam talks a little bit here about um, pseudocode, uh, I probably err on the side of making my kids show me a great pseudocode maybe when they wouldn't even have to. But they always have pseudocode at the beginning of their program. If they don't have pseudocode, that's, they have to have pseudocode. It's kind of a rough draft which allows them to go ahead and program. So create a flow chart, how to pour a glass of milk. Uh, you can do anything with this flowchart of how to tie your shoe, you know, how to put your socks and shoes on. 
things like that. Um, but it won't take very long, and it will um, at least allow them to see that and not be overwhelmed if they see it on the final. So I don't think it'll take a long time uh, to get through that, but every other PowerPoint that Adam or I are going to talk you through, um, all the rest of them I put on my website, and my students, as they're progressing through the um, 311 through 316, um, they go on their computer and take notes, go through that and take notes. And I check that off on that sheet that I sent you, um, kind of check off sheets, make sure they've taken those notes. Um, the first year I tried to present those, but everybody was trying to do a different thing on the computer, and I was just running around crazy trying to fix typos on the computer. And so if everybody's on their own and they have a, you know, when they get to question, they can ask me and I can just kind of deal with it. But the flow charting, because it would be so easy to blow off, um, I do ask them to do that, especially now that I know there's some questions out there on that. Anybody have a question they need to discuss? I think Adam maybe got some of them. All good. Okay, Adam, do you want to take, um, uh, sent it la before the last meeting. I sent that out. <clears throat> Amy, if you don't find that, let me know. Okay. Um, the uh, probably the day of the last meeting, I think. Um, Adam, do you want to take it over and talk for about C a little bit? All right. <clears throat> Okay, hopefully um, you were able to get access to a computer with Robot C um, tonight, this evening. Um, you able, are everybody able to see the screen? Is that good? It's okay. Just making sure before I continue to talk and it's not even up. <laughs> um, so um, hopefully you can get there. And, and kind of what we want to do is just go back and review starting up, making sure you have everything set up properly. Um, again, talking about that pseudocode task description stuff and then giving you just a couple basic challenges here um, to, uh, to try your hand at programming, if you will, give you a couple minutes to practice it and then to come back. Um, if you, you know, aren't able to have Robot C in front of you, um, you can always just open up you know, a text document or something and, and just start to type and see how close that you get to it. Okay. So uh, again, the, the steps that I always use for the students, I kind of have like a, a list of things that they need to make sure they do that I, I make sure that they copy down when we go over this the first time. You know, one of the things they need to do is to, um, you know, get connected, uh, make sure they're on a computer that has the current software. You know, typically that's something I set up beforehand, but it's always good to make sure that they have the proper software. Um, then I have them come in, open up a template, so we go to this open sample program, and they go down to the Project Lead the Way folder. It open up one of the templates. Okay, and, and again, since you know th there could be a problem with their students having access to this because they could um, they need to have access to like a folder in the C drive, and sometimes depending on the rights of the computers, um, they might not be able to actually get to this. So make sure they have access to it. If not, you know, have it spare, have it handy on a flash drive for them. Um, but what I do right away is then tell them to save it. So they'll save as their file. Um, and again, inevitably, my students like to just save it. They don't look where they're saving it. But um, I also try to make sure they have them saved as a proper format. So I, I usually do first initial last name underscore whatever it is. So the students, when I'm looking at all the different files, I know exactly who it is and what the file is. So they've saved it. Now we need to make sure we check to, that we're in the right language and platform type. Um, and that's one of the locations you can do it is up here underneath robot. So uh, we check our platform type. It should be VEX 2.0 and it should be natural language PLTW. Okay. So make sure they're selected. If they're not selected, then you just have to go in and you should have an extension here to be able to check it. All right, so that's checked. I have the right platform type. I have the right language type. That's all good. Um, then the last thing we need to do is set up our motors and sensors. 
Okay. So one of the places you can access this is underneath robot or on your desktop. You'll see there's a motors and sensors uh, tab there as well that you can use. So I'm just going to click this one right here. Okay. So if you're not already here, go ahead and get to this point. What we're going to do is have you um, enter in a few things so that when you're practicing, we can all use the same um, names for the motors and that type of stuff. And what we'll end up doing for this is we'll use the same um, names that we would use, that the students are going to use through 3.1 through 3.16, 3.1.1 um, through 3.1.6. Um, so they'll, they'll have uh, two motors in here. One will be called right motor, one will be called left motor. Uh, and then we'll use a limit switch, which I believe this one, uh, I think we call it limit, right? Right. I for, yeah, that one I always forget a little bit. But um, So in Robot C, you can, it doesn't really matter right now, the port number. Um, but for us, we can just have it right in port number one underneath the motors tab. And I just type in right motor without any spacing. Um, when you're naming things, typically I try to keep them really short. You know, this starting off is a little bit longer than you would, but as you get better, you'll shorten things up. And since it's two words, we don't put a space in there, but we have a lowercase first letter and then an uppercase for the second letter. That kind of shows the spacing. Um, then you can go ahead and change your motor type. Uh, and for our purposes, we'll just use a 393 motor. Any questions on that setup? Anybody need me to back up or? Yeah, if and you. Remember, remember on those motors, um, it's easy for the kids to forget that they need the motor that Adam's talking about. Did you say the 393? Yeah. So it's a 269 and the 393. The 269 is the littler of the motors. The 393 is the bigger. Sorry. Um, that that needs what we call a motor controller, which is like an extension cord. It converts um, from sorry, I don't know, uh, converts from the two wire to the three wire. If the kids plug in the two wires into the motor ports, the motors will just run incessantly. And so um, make sure that you get, I just like to keep a motor controller hooked to every motor and then we don't have to mess with it, but it inevitably gets pulled off. So um, just be super careful with that. Okay. So we'll have a right motor and then we'll just do a left motor. And again, just throw in a 393. And you can see, like, if we, we go to their motors tab, it, there's there's um, different motors, like the servo or full rotational motors, and then you can actually change the gearing to make them high speed or to make them high torque. So depending on your setup, you might choose a different one here. Um, but for us, we're just going to choose that 393. Okay. And then we'll throw on a sensor. Um, we're just going to put in a digital sensor, which is our limit switch. So underneath the digital one, we'll just type in limit and then touch it or change it to a touch sensor because our limit and our bump switches are all going to be touch sensors. Um, we'll have other devices in there called uh, our quad encoder. Um, notice what happens though. Let me show you this here. If I were to put in a quad here, when you actually select this, it, it chooses two channels here your quad and your sonar, when you plug them, and actually have two plugs, so you need to have two ports set up so that when you use it, it gets used properly. Get rid of that guy. Okay, once you have them set up, you can go ahead and hit apply, and then hit okay. And what should have happened if you did that properly, if everything worked out right, is it should have built your pragma lines up here where you have your, um, tells you your port number, tells you what you called it and what type of sensor you chose. Um, and what's nice about that is as you're programming, if you forget, oh, how did I name that? Was that a capital R for right motor or loader case? You can just scroll up to the top and you can see it. Um, you don't necessarily have to go back to your motors and sensors setup to see that. Okay. So um, what we're going to do for the first one is 
this. So we'll say for our task description here, um, typically uh, the task description is going to be more of like a sentence structure type thing where you're being asked to perform some sort of task. And it would give um, you know a description of what they're looking for and what needs to happen as you're going through the, the task. Okay. So for our task, we just have here that start the right motor at full speed for five seconds and then turn it off. So just a real simple, quick program just getting us into it. So when I would go down to my pseudocode, what I'm looking for here is not the actual code. And a lot of times my students will just put the code there and then copy paste it down to the task main. And it's, it's not the same thing. It's supposed to be like the pieces that you would get. So if we go back to that flow charting stuff, uh, we're looking at, okay, well, what's the first thing that needs to happen? Okay, well, the first thing I need to do is I need to start the right motor. Okay, at what speed? It needs to be started at this speed. Okay, now I need to do this, and so on and so forth. So it's those big blocks of things that are happening, and it helps the students organize their thoughts so that if we have this large program for a design challenge, we can go in there and break it down to the pieces and really figure it out. So for me, and there's many different methods for doing this. For me, I just kind of do it pretty simply, and just for the first step we're going to do here is we're going to start the right motor. And... Uh, I might not necessarily call it exactly the way it's named, but I'm going to start the right motor at full speed. You could even get into here and put in, if you wanted to say instead of full speed, you could put in the full power for us, which is 127 in one direction or negative 127 in the other direction. All right, so then I need to wait for five seconds. Uh, and then I'm going to stop the right motor. Okay. Again, it's a real simple program, so pseudocode almost is lost in something that's this small because it's not that complex. Um, but again, we have to learn to uh, crawl before we can walk here. Any questions on, on, on that aspect, the task description of the pseudocode? So everything that's in green is not being writ read by the computer. Correct. So anything that is blocked in green, you'll notice at the beginning of um, above project title, it's got a slash and asterisk, and that says everything until you see an asterisk and a slash is going to be in pseudocode. So um, it gives you the ability to talk and document, but the computer's not reading any of that. So the ki all the kids you want to like, they're like, I want to change the color of the font because they're so used to doing that. I'm like, the color of the font means something. So yeah. anything that's green is not being read by the computer. So every once in a while, kids will copy and paste something in, and they've copied in a, a code that's commented, and it won't run because the computer's not reading it. So if it's green, the computer doesn't even know it's there. It's kind of like when you're little and somebody wrote in cursive. You couldn't read it. So um, it is not being read by the computer. Only the blue and the red is. Yeah, that's a good point to make. Um, and, and sometimes what ends up happening is your students will accidentally delete like this part right here, and then they find out that, uh-oh, everything's now green. So you just go back in and enter that stuff in, and now it cuts it off. It says just from here to here is commented. All right. So um, we have our simple start the right motor, okay? Uh, wait for five seconds, stop the right motor. So we're at the point now where we've, we've broken it down to our chunks and we can start to do our, our, our coding, if you will. Um, what I like to do here is, uh, at first with the students, I just drag and drop the stuff to show them how to do that. And then what ends up happening, and, and pretty quickly, within you know, a day or two, the students get the, the, the syntax for you know, the way they need to put down start motor in the order. And instead of dragging and dropping, it's much faster just to type it. But at first, it's really nice to have these this library on the left-hand side. And, and right now, mine's actually uh, might be a little bit more um, robust than yours because I have the menu level turned up here. So let me turn it down. So you can actually change the level as you get better. There's more code available, more functions available for you. So I need to do um, movement because I'm going to start a motor. Um, and here is start motor, 
And what's nice about it is you can see there's, and I can't move my cursor here, but you can see there's a little window that pops up that gives you an explanation of what it is. It even lets you know what your minimum and maximum values are. And it lets you know even where on the cortex you can actually put this. Um, so it, it's, it gives you a lot of really helpful hints for the students. So I'm just going to click and drag that out. So I have my start motor. And then I need to choose my motor port, which I called this one right motor. So I go ahead and type that in. And notice when I'm going to choose, instead of having to click to erase this to drag across here, you can just double click it and it actually will get rid of, um, it'll highlight that whole thing and then we can just get rid of it as soon as we start typing. So I just did at full speed, well, let's put in 127 for full speed. Um, again, our ranges, you have basically 255 inputs here. So anywhere from negative 127 to a positive 127, depending on the direction of rotation. Okay. So then I'm, what, what's nice, the students need to, to be able to realize this. Um, they'll see a line of code here. It'll say start motor. All right, which port? Okay, this is the port. On what speed? Here's the speed. And then the computer says, okay, when am I done this command? Right here, this semicolon is telling the computer, okay, stop. Now look for the next line. And what I could do if I wanted to, I could actually put the next line right next to this, putting in my wait time. And it would, the computer would read it just the same way as if I hit enter and put it down here. Okay? Spaces don't mean anything to the computer. They just look at it as one single line, essentially. Um, I make sure the students do it this way, just because it's a lot easier for me to walk from one computer to the next and to, to check when there's mistakes. If they're all over the place, I just walk away um, because it's going to take me, you know, how many minutes just to figure out what the heck's going on before I can figure out what's wrong. So it's really important that they do keep things organized um, or it's going to get crazy very quick. So I know I typed this one in, but let me go ahead and find that one. So um, I'm going to go back over to my natural language section here. I'm looking to wait. Um, notice that there's two different commands you can use. You can wait in seconds or we can wait in milliseconds for us. Waiting in seconds is going to work. I'm just going to double click here, put in my five, and we're good to go. All right, so we're waiting five seconds, finish line with the semicolon, and now I need to stop the right motor. So I go back up to my robot motion, or excuse me, my movement, and I can say stop motor. And I just double click and put in here right motor. And notice when we say stop motor, we don't have to put in a speed. Um, the nice thing about natural language is they, they made it easier for the students. So it's not just like if you were using Arduino, you have to do a lot of setup for this. And we wouldn't exactly just say stop motor, right motor. We'd have to put in speeds and different things. So it's a little bit different. So they made it a little bit simpler for the students. Um, and, and it's very approachable for them. OK. So this would do what we're asking to do. It would run the motor at full power. And because it's waiting here for five seconds, there's nothing telling the motor to stop until after five seconds. Then we get to the next line of code. It stops, and then it terminates the program once it sees this curly brace. And that's another important thing to mention here, too, because the, the curly braces, this open curly brace and this closed curly brace, is telling us where to look at the code. So my task main is this whole task right here. Well, how do I know what, what is included in that task? Well, the computer knows it because it's from here to here, okay? If we were able to actually break down the code um, on our the menu on the left-hand side in the library, this little ability to expand and collapse, that inside the code is actually an open curly and a closed curly. So I can actually expand that to see everything inside, or I can collapse it where they would, you know, the curly braces, which kind of, you know, slide together, if you will, so that it kind of hides all that stuff. All right. So I know a lot of you are probably novices, and it's not really, um, you're not super skilled at this at this point. So we want to give you a little bit more of a challenge here um, and just have you We'll do this one right here. All right, so we're going to start right motor at half speed for three seconds. 
we're going to start the left motor at quarter speed for three seconds, turn off the right motor, reverse the direction of the left motor, and then after three seconds, stop the left motor. So what we can do is give you a couple of minutes here um, to, to take a stab at it, uh, and then we'll come back together and I'll kind of show you what, um, what I came up with. Every line that you write is either going to end with a semicolon or the next line is going to start with a curly brace. So as you're, as you're writing, um, death by semicolon can easily happen on this. So at the end of each line, um, you are either going to have a semicolon because that's the end of that command, or like Adam said with that uh, main, it didn't have a semicolon at the end of it because it has a curly brace on the next line. So that grouping says everything in here. And, and ultimately, we're going to talk you guys through some, some different commands, some loops of sorts, and they will also use the curly braces. But semicolon, everything either ends with a semicolon or the next line starts with a curly brace. If you have any questions while you're putting this together, shout out, let us know. And do your kids have much programming experience when you get them? I would say like, you know, if I have a class of 20, maybe one or two, you know, that, that really have stuff. Some others have some basic stuff, but for the most part, not really. Yeah, I think my number's actually gone down. I mean, I think if I had more kids that hardcore program. Um, I think I have some kids now that like are app, <laughs> like app makers, but mm -hmm. don't really code, um, kind of icon based. Um, but I think that number's gone down. I'm the same way. I'll have like one or two that really know how to code. So you don't have natural language on the side. Oop, moving things around. What is this? Michael, can you hear me? Can you talk? can now can you hear me yes I can hear you so so you say on the left hand yeah. side you have uh, everything except for the natural language yeah um, underneath your robot and your platform type do you have 2.0 and, and uh, natural language PLTW selected I had cortex ah, okay that's it Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> that worked. Yeah, well, that's a good problem to have because that's a problem your students are going to do quite a bit. <laughs> and they'll do it a day at a time. They'll have, it'll all have worked, and the next day it won't work. And they're like, all these all these errors are coming up, and it worked yesterday, and that's because, you know, it's expecting Spanish, and you typed it in French, basically, is what I tell them if they're mm -hmm. in a different language. That this program is set up to read several languages, and you need to make sure that it just knows what language it's reading. <laughs> yeah, Amy, you should have uh, the VEX 2.0 Cortex and then the Natural Language PLTW. So you have to select both your platform type and your the language that we're using. Good. I know. I just um, I just took that class. You know, how you have to take three classes before you go to the ten day training in the summer. Yeah, the online. Your oh. yeah, I, yeah. I just took the robotics one, so this was that was really helpful for being able to do this. Okay. Oh, 
it's good to hear it wasn't a waste of your time. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. So that's an interesting question because um, when I had originally started to take the readiness training, I actually never made it out of the first course because one of the questions had no correct answer. So no matter what answer you put, you couldn't hit the right answer. So I never actually passed that first general principles of, um, you know, kind of what's project-based learning and why is CPLL uh, project the way important, that kind of stuff. And so I never actually passed that because one of the questions had no right answer. But they oh, never uh, that by chance. I, I put it in the help message and I was never contacted. So do I have to take three classes before I go to summer training? I guess I missed yeah. that. Um, do you, uh, did you, were you doing that training on a laptop or on a big computer screen? Oh my god, it was so long ago I couldn't tell you where it was. Um, um, some, I, sometimes, I just, if you're doing it on a laptop, there's really more to the question that sometimes gets cut off on a little screen. Um, and if you go do that on a, like a desktop that has a bigger screen, there might be more to the question that you didn't see, and that's why it doesn't seem to have a correct answer. There's like a part two to it. Um, so you might, if you go into that, you might try and do it. Like my laptop, when I was running through the readiness training before last summer, just to see what my students were going through, um, I couldn't see all of the question on a couple of them, or the submit button wasn't there. I was like, there's no way to ever get past this screen. Um, but when I sat down at a bigger computer, um, then the question presented itself. So that would be my recommendation, because I, I got stuck when I was using a laptop, because the screen was too small to see all of it. Well, I, I can go back and try it again, because that was like in September or October, where yeah. I was just trying to get through the day, and yeah. I tried to do everything yeah. like this, and I couldn't. But now I guess I'm a little further ahead, and I want to take the summer training. And I guess if there's robot training or uh, programming training, I, I'd be interested in taking that. So where do you yeah. find that? Is that on the LMS? Yeah, I had to. I had to be signed up for it. I was gonna add um, when I was taking mine. You can take that quiz as many times as you want to, and it's the same questions over and over and over again. Yeah. So maybe if you just like wrote answer. down. Yeah, I mean, I, I did. I, I like took it over and over and over again. I okay, question. This one's wrong. Okay, A. That one's wrong. B. That one's wrong. C. That one's wrong. You know, I mean, there was no right answer. I. Oh. I I, I well, maybe they fixed that. it because I just took it and I got it. So maybe there was a glitch that they fixed. Okay, but um, and that would actually. And how did you get signed up for that? From them. Um, oh. I, my my boss had me signed up, and then I got an email saying that I was registered somehow. It was way back at the beginning of the year. So my guess is that your boss signed you up for a training class, and that's how you became yeah. a participant in the readiness training. So yeah, that's you, right. If you have not, if your if your school district hasn't signed you up for a training session, then you won't. But it sounds like you must have been in, must have been in something. So, yeah, maybe the same thing. So if I want to take a class during the summer, and I, I guess now they're going through the, they have to go to the school board and get authorization to spend the money in order to send me to the class, and so that whole process is going. Um, and so I guess at the point in time they sign me up is when somebody will say, oh, there's a programming course. Well, the writing is training. I need to take it. the programming course that woman just said she took that was very helpful. Yeah, I think it's all part of the readiness training that's in there. Yeah, again, yeah, um, Harry, the, one of the questions you have actually brings up a good point. Um, when you load your robot C on your computers, it actually comes with several icons um, because there's different, there's different um, ways of using robot C, if you will. You can use it as a virtual machine. You can use it as a graphical interface. Um, there's the text base, which we want. So our license right. for PLTW only goes for the, the text based version. Um, but it'll still put the, the other ones down there and 
I just delete them right off the screen because the kids will click on them to have the same issues. Hopefully that's not your problem, but... Can you hear me, uh, Adam? Yes, can hear you. So, so let me go and check if it's a text base. I'll double check that one. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I do see lots of them. That was a confusion I had. So does it say text base somewhere at the... Where does it say text base? Um, the actual icon says uh, Robot C for VEX Robotics. It'll say like 4.0. Kind of graphical. I see graphical. Not that one. Okay, there's a robot C for this one. Um, I don't know which one you're choosing. Robot C for VEX Robotics. Correct. Yeah, the one that says Robot C for VEX Robotics. That's the one. Okay, let me see. Not the PLTW, right? I got. Okay, let me see. It's Should kind of a gray green circle. Because it's working with. Uh, in my student's computer, everything is perfect, but in my own computer, I have a trouble. Hmm. Do you have a smart on your computer? Do you show? Do you have smart documents on your computer? What is smart? Uh, like, do you have a smart board? Yeah. You uh, any, like, you dock your computer and you can write on the smart board? Right, right, right. I, yeah, I have a software, yeah. Okay, if you have that software, it conflicts with the uh, robot C. Oh, I see. So what should I do? Yeah, I do have you one need, of those. You need two different. You need a you need a computer to do your engineering, your robot C on, and a computer to do your smart on. Um, oh, I really? Yeah, okay. Computers because yeah. they conflict with each other. Wow, it's good to know. <laughs> yeah, that one. That one you should probably be able to answer if you email school support. Probably be the way at school support PLTW at system. Cool. Yeah, write it down. Okay. W at school. Yeah, I can. I can. Support. I can bring my own laptop. It's not a problem. Yeah. yeah, and and just disabling it doesn't fix it. So you can't just be like, oh, I'll go in and disable the smart. Like it has to be off the computer. Oh, I see. So good to know. That's a good point. So that might be it because I got, yeah, that software. One of those. Uh, yeah. Okay. Makes if you sense. have that, it may not be on your kids' computers, and it may be on yours. I see. Okay, that's fine. So I'll just watch it, what you guys are doing because this thing works in my student's computer, anyways. Okay. Next time I'll have a separate computer. Sounds Thank good. Thank you. Um, all right. So let's let's take a look at um, what I would do at, at a basic level of programming. At, at this point, when students are starting out, we're doing what we would call linear-based programming, meaning we just basically start at the top and we work our way straight down. Eventually, we're going to move into a nonlinear where we're kind of asking questions and based off of what's happening, we do different things. Um, so uh, at this point, it's, it's usually pretty easy for the students, but we want to get them to a higher level eventually. So the first line, our task description, um, is going to ask us to do the uh, start the right motor at half speed for three seconds. So I could have in here start right motor and then half speed for three seconds. So um, 127 is our full power, so I can choose 63. It's pretty close to half speed. Wait, we're going to have for three seconds. Um, and then we can start the left motor uh, at quarter speed. Um, so if you try to figure out what half or what quarter of 127 is, it gets to be a little bit more difficult, but you can bring out your trusty calculator, hopefully, and divide that by four. So roughly 32 for now. I'll show you another handy trick later. Um, and then what we can do is turn off the right motor. So stop right motor. And then in order to reverse the direction, so we need to uh, change the direction of the left motor. So we're going to start the motor again, but we need to change the direction. And one of the ways that we use to change the direction is just by putting a negative in front of our power. And it makes it go the other direction. And then we need to wait three seconds again. And then after those three seconds, we're going to stop the left motor. So it kind of broke this down, even though this wasn't really sentence structure up there, but it kind of broke it down into the chunks that we need to do. All right. So uh, first thing I want to do is start my right motor so I can grab my movement, start the motor, drag that down, 
double click on my motor port here and put in right motor. Um, and one of the things I want to show you right now is um, we have the ability to do math within our programming. So where it asks us to do half speed, we could just type in 63, which is close to half speed. Um, but if we wanted to get it, make it a little bit easier, you know, especially with the math, if it doesn't pop quickly, especially for a lot of students, um, we can take 127 and divide it by 2, and that's going to give us half speed. So it makes it a little bit easier. So mm. quite often, that's the method that I use. All right, so wait mm. three seconds. And then it wants us to start the left motor, so I can grab the start command again, type in my left motor, and then now this one's quarter speed, so hopefully you put this together, but you put 127 divided by 4. Again, it wants us to wait three seconds, so I can grab my command again and just copy it and paste it down here. Um, then it says stop the right motor. All right, so let's stop the right motor and then we're looking to start the left motor in reverse so I can again grab this and kind of change some code so I'll, I'll start the left motor again but I want it to go in reverse so I just put in a negative in front of the power so now it's going to go exactly the same speed just the other direction I'm going to wait three seconds again so I'm just going to copy this and paste it in and then stop the left motor. So I can go ahead and grab this. Stop left motor. Okay. So um, I wanted to kind of show you quickly a couple of different ways of doing it. So you saw that I went through and we were able just to type. And as I started to type things out, for example, wait, you can see that down here it gives you a bunch of different examples that I can then double click on, and then it gives us what it is. Um, so you can start to use that. Uh, and other methods we were using just dragging and dropping, or you're able to copy and paste. So there's multiple methods that you can use in order to get your code done a little bit faster. Um, one of the things that's nice is, Let's think, uh, oh, I'm going through the program, and you know what? I messed up. This code right here um, wasn't actually supposed to be on that line. So one of the things you could do is delete it or cut it out of there and then move it down, paste it down somewhere else, um, or you could simply highlight it, and then you just drag it. It allows you just to drag and drop it wherever you want to actually insert that into the program. So it's kind of a neat feature because a lot of times, there's a part of the program that you just need to move and you don't necessarily want to copy paste it it's a little bit faster okay so the the weight is it just is a timer essentially so inside robot C there's actually um, four internal timers that we can manipulate if you will and then there's two internal timers that just run um, that we can't really change but we can do things based off of what time they're running at um, so it just sits and waits. So when I say start right motor at half speed and then wait, it just waits three seconds. It doesn't do anything else. The motor's still running because we never told it to stop. It's just waiting. Um, and then we do another command and then we move and we just wait. So it's kind of a way of slowing the program down. Um, if we didn't have the weights, which is kind of a good point here. So if I got rid of these weights, what would end up in this program is because our program runs super quick, um, you know, if, if, if every condition is met, it will run as the snap of the finger. It will just run straight down through your program. So if I hit start, turn this program on, it wouldn't actually, you never see the motors actually start because it would super quickly run through this program and then just terminate the program. Um, so we have to slow it down. One of the methods for slowing it down is to put in those wait times. Um, we'll find out next time that there's other methods that we use for slowing things down and making sure that it works. Correct, yep. Okay. So uh, what we'll look at then for next time is, is to kind of keep going on with the programming. We'll get into our uh, control structures, which is the while and the if else stuff. Uh, we'll start to talk about um, some variables and things. So we do want to take some more time with the programming because it ends up being something that uh, 
it, it takes time to really practice and, and uh, try to get. Um, so next meeting will be the 15th, I believe, if I'm correct. Um, and then uh, we will continue on with that. Any questions out there? Hey, did your question get answered about what was happening to right and left? I missed that. Right so, now. so the one, okay. the way that we have it programmed, it would turn the right motor on for three seconds before turning on the left motor. Correct. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's the right motor. Okay. Runs six. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So, and you could, and that's another good question too, because if I got rid of this weight right here. Um, the start right motor, start left motor would happen, you wouldn't even notice a difference. They would start basically at the same time. Um, and then they both would run for three seconds until the turn, right motor turned off uh, and we changed direction. Okay, that was what I was asking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Robin, you had a question on that program that about your um, NCSA 1000 you and turn on for six seconds um, after it's a program question, but I'm kind of chat to that and then we just got it. Anybody else have any other programming questions? I didn't quite hear what you said. Um, you had some questions in the email that I sent out about the SSA 1000, about your stress yeah. analyzer. And yeah. uh, I could I could kind of run you through a, a little bit of that. I was just going to let everybody else have if they had a... Um, any programming questions you want to ask Adam real quick. Okay. All right. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, I missed the beginning. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I missed the beginning to, uh, having some technical difficulties. Did you talk at all about the simulation part? Um, not really. Just briefly mentioned it. Okay. Is that something you use more? Uh, in the beginning, or do you not really use it much? I don't use it at all. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with the simulation software. Uh, I know there's like virtual worlds that you can you can get and you can actually run through and do programming with, but it's not something that I do. Okay. Adam, quick question on the speed. Yes. Why there is a reverse speed? I was trying to understand. Uh, one is negative, one is positive. Correct. Yeah. So um, on your motors, they're either spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, and if you had okay. a motor set up, you know, like a like a car or something like that, and you wanted to go forward. Oh, or left and right. Okay, got it. Yeah, or left and right. Yeah, something to that effect. Correct. Oh, I got it. Okay, the directions. Okay, got it. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Good question. Cool. All right. Okay. Uh, then we'll see everybody next week. And if you again, you can try to make sure you are, have Robot C available. We'll try to do something similar where we give you a chance to try something, and then we kind of go over how we might solve it. Hey, Robin. Um, so you have an SSA 1000 in your room, which I think is awesome. It's one of my favorite purchases. So it, uh, it's a plant stand for a lot of the class time, but I love it. The two weeks that I use it. Um, you want to make sure that um, your SSA 1000, the plug that comes out of it, um, fits your computers. So since I've purchased mine, um, the uh, port that comes out, um, the plug that comes out do doesn't fit my new computers. So last year I had to purchase an adapter. And then figure out the adapter software for that. So that's one thing that you want to make sure that you have um, under control. Um, right. That you have it. You want to make sure that you have the um, SSA 1000 um, software downloaded on your computer. Um, you can actually get that on the website. Um, I struggled with that a little bit this year in that um, there were some files or embedded in a folder that you had to, only because I'm really super smart kid figure this out, I was stuck, um, pull them out of a file, put them into another file, and then it could read it. And uh, if you call uh, the manufacturing company, like, it's a machine shop. Like, they'll just talk to you. But Sal is their SSA 1000 guy. 
Um, and the guy that actually understands the programming side of it um, actually no longer works for that company, but works next door. So they'll take their cordless phone and walk over and you can talk to them. They're like super kind um, human beings who happen to have made this product for Project Lead the Way and now have to make sure that we all can use it. So um, I definitely try and rip something and get the get the data to work. Um, make sure you've got it before you get your kids' samples in there. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. Um, I think I've taken the notes down. I did look at the website, but one thing I was looking for a user manual, and I don't find one. I don't know. We probably had that piece of equipment maybe for quite a while. I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, they might, if you them. call them, they might have it. Okay. Um, I I don't even know. I don't even know if mine came with a user manual, to be honest. Okay. Reflectively. I but, thought on the website there was like a PDF, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think. Just a description. Yeah, I did see that a description and. Um, yeah, that's about all. That's about all they. Um, it's. I mean, but they're super kind if you call them. They'll okay. talk you through what's plugged in and okay. what's on your ports and that kind of deal. Okay. Um, but um, they're on East Coast time, which sometimes benefits me and sometimes works against me because I'm on uh, Central. But okay. Well, I'm East Coast, so. Me too. And I for I forget where they're located, but I noticed New York. that. New York. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, like it's eight to four year time or something like that. They're they're really early, but that may be the uh -huh. time. Well, uh, maybe I can call during planning periods if I need to talk with them. And uh, yeah, they're super they're super kind. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, and I I just uh, you know pulled it out and try to look up some information, but I'll just have to, I wrote down the notes that you gave me, so that will help, and I'll try to make sure that I can get the software downloaded, um, if it's not oh, already so cool. on the computer. Okay. So yeah, I if you want to, if you want to, you know, um, if you want to try and run a sample of it sometime, like, after school or something, please let me know. You can call me and we can kind of be online together or maybe even Skype so we can kind of talk about what's going on if, if you're struggling with it and they can't help you out. Okay, I'd love that. Thank you so much for that offer. I appreciate it. No problem. Because that would help. Yeah. Definitely. It's super cool. I love that. Good. That sounds like fun. Good. They should enjoy that then. Yeah, my kids really like it. It's always fun to break stuff. Um, it is. Yeah, that's what I was thing. thinking. Oh, they're going to love this, you know. <laughs> so I'm sure that is. A, most of them enjoy that activity. So. Thank you. See you next week. Okay. Have a thank good one. You. Okay, well, thank you so much. Good Robin. Um, so I will...